that was written by one of our nuns in Santa Barbara who wrote hundreds of pieces. She's uh, passed away, but in her time as a nun there, she wrote hundreds of devotional songs. Chakshushrotramato balamindriyani chasarvani Sarvam brahma upanishadam Maham brahma nirakaro Anirakaranam astva nirakaranam mestu Tadatmani nirateya upanishad su dharmaste mai santu te mai santu. Om, may my limbs, speech, the vital forces, eyes, ears, as also strength, and all the sense organs become well developed. Everything is the Brahman revealed in the Upanishads. May I not deny Brahman. May not Brahman deny me. Let there be no spurning of me by Brahman. Let there be no rejection of Brahman by me. May all the virtues that are spoken of in the Upanishads repose in me, who am engaged in the pursuit of the Atman. May they repose in me. Om, peace, peace, peace. Today, is an auspicious day. This is the birthday of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the avatar of love. And he preached just this, love God. And how do we do that? Keep on repeating his name. Chant the name of the Lord and his glories unceasingly. This is part of that shikshashtakam, the prayer of Chaitanya that we chant every morning here and in most of our centers of the Southern California. It's, it's also the, the holy, where the, the demoness holika was burnt it also signifies the burning of karma, Cupid. So on this day, let us all join our minds to that great spirit that is enlivening us and which has been enlivening the human mind for these thousands and thousands of years. The topic today is the Upanishad's secret knowledge. Well, Chaitanya also was a great, great scholar. He had also written a commentary on the Brahma Sutras. That implies that he was very, very well versed in the Vedic and the Upanishadic teachings. The Upanishads are the scripture, as always Swami Vivekananda says, the Bible of India. And they contain the essence of the philosophical or metaphysical doctrines 
and they come to you straight as poetry. They are mystical writings and one has to unravel them gradually. All subsequent religious development in India had to base their teachings and their doctrines on the Upanishads. Well, if they didn't, they were considered heterodox, not heretical, but for example, Buddhism and Jainism, they never accepted the Vedas and the Upanishads as authority, though Buddha himself was a member of the monks of the Upanishadic orders. And what do the Upanishads teach? That reality which is transcendent at the same time imminent it teaches of that reality as embodied principle. It teaches liberation from samsara. It teaches meditation. This is brief is the Upanishads. It also forms the triad called the Prasthana Traya, the three foundational, you can say, principles on which Hinduism rests. They are the Shruti, that which is the Vedic lore, the Vedic teachings, which was heard, Shruti, the Upanishads. And after that, one has to deliberate on it. It's called Yukti, through logic and reasoning. And that forms the Brahma Sutras. And after you have done this, then you meditate and the Anubhuti, the experiential doctrines are found in the Bhagavad Gita. So the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra, and the Bhagavad Gita, these, this triad forms the foundation of modern Vedanta, modern Hinduism. It's also called Jnanakanda, the knowledge portion of the Vedas. The first portion is called the Karma Kanda, which contains the mantras and the brahmanas. The Aranyakas, the forest treatises, stand between the old and the new, the latest, that is Upanishads. We find a kind of a gradual evolution of spiritual thoughts as they come to, towards the end of the Vedic, you can say, scripture, they are called the end of the Vedas, Vedanta, or the culmination of the, Ved of the Vedas. They are also called the Aranyakas, the forest treatises. They are also called Rahasya, secret knowledge. They are the crown jewel of spiritual thought that had been experienced by various rishis, sages. Now these rishis were, as were, both male and female. So we have also rishikas. We also had someone whom we call as Raja rishis, the kingly sages. So it was not a result of exclusive hermitages and ascetics. We had kings and we had women sages also as rishis. In the earlier sections of the Vedas, the ceremonials, what we call as yagnas and yagas, had multiplied and become so intricate and so we find a great departure made in the Vedic literature, in the Upanishads, where we find that they have internalized those ideas, those ceremonies, those yagnas, and they have explained it gently by showing 
the higher aspects of those ceremonies and yagnas and yagas. We find that these Upanishads were discussions held either in the Brahma Sansadi, the assemblage, assembly of the nose of Brahman, as well as in the courts of the kings. And after the discussions, a kind of a shorthand, these were shorthand notes, which were, you can put down from memory. The old traditions which were attached to some of those teachings have all but disappeared. That is, so we are left only with those luminous teachings. And that's why it is absolutely necessary for us to study the Upanishads in the light of the commentaries. So we get a glimpse into some of these old traditions. Well, how old is the Upanishadic literature? Well, they were pretty old even when Buddha was born, 565 before Common Era. They are clearly pre-Buddhistic, they are clearly pre-Jainism. And not only that, we find the language is more modern than the earlier portions of the Vedas. So there has been an evolution of Sanskrit language over millennia. After 600 to 600 before Common Era, we have someone who called Panini, who brought out the Sanskrit grammar in a structured form, and that became classical Sanskrit. So this is clearly pre-classical Sanskrit. It's not only, and the Vedas are written uh, in Vedic language. Even before that, there was something called an oral long tradition. So we find there has been a continuity of these traditions and these teachings over thousands and thousands of years. So, like Swami Vivekananda says, nobody really knows when these truths really flashed in the minds of those rishis. And Western scholars, they leave us even more confused. Sanskrit, as it was written, is 1,500 before Common Era. And clearly, this was even earlier. So the mean, technical meaning of the word Upanishad is, one of the meaning is, the prefix is Upa, Ni, Shad. So Upa and Ni are prefixes. And Shad is the root with the suffix quip. So what does it mean? It means to approach that knowledge, that knowledge which loosens, which destroys, or splits up ignorance. That is that metaphysical ignorance that we talk about, ajnana. It also means the knowledge of the noble entity. It also means that upasad, you come close by and sit down near the teacher and deliberate on it intensely and steadfastly, which is called ni. So upa ni shad. So Swami Vivekananda translates as that, the sittings. These were the forest hermitages, the ashrams, where the students used to go, 
sit down in front of the teacher and listen to those teachings. First, memorize them, and after memorizing them, deliberate them. It also means, Upanishad means, Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of Brahman, because this knowledge leads us to that reality which is called Brahman, which is spoken of in the Upanishads. When we are born, we are born with five debts that need to be repaid throughout one's life. The first debt is Rishi Rina, our debts to the Rishis. And how do we repay them? We repay them by studying the scriptures that they have left for us. And then there are the other debts to the gods, to the ancestors, to the human beings, to all, to society rather, and to all living beings. So one has to repay these debts, the five debts. So the first one, as I said, the number of Upanishads. Well, there have been Jacobs and even Radhakrishnan has translated something called the 13 principal Upanishads. They are called the Brihadaranyakya, the Chandogya, the Kata, the Kaushitaki, Maitriyani, the Kena, and then we have Mundaka, Mandukya, Aitriya, Isha, Svetashvatra, Prashna. Yeah. But these are the principal ones. There are more than 100 Upanishads. There's a book published called 108 Upanishads. Of course, some of the Upanishads are, you can see from the style, they are quite modern. They were written much later than these principal ones. Swami Vivekananda says, the language and the thought comes to you direct. It's like a sword blade falling down or like a hammer falling down. No gyrations, no mincing of words, no trying to kind of, as you say, trying to elude our understanding. So these words come to us straight. It is for the first time that the superfine is spoken of in the language of the superfine. Metaphysics is spoken of in the language of poetry. Spirit is spoken of in the spiritual language. No matter, no material, you can say, things are now attached to this. So those rishis were bold, brave, uncompromising. They went down and searched the truth and they preached that truth without any kind of, you can say, pressure. Swami Vivekananda says, this Vedanta, the philosophy of the Upanishads, I would make bold to state, has been the first as well as the final thought on the spiritual plane that has ever been vouchsafed to mankind. Yes, this is the grand scheme. And every possible angle of vision has been scrutinized, utilized, and trodden by these. So we have a vast mass of sublime teachings which are purely Advaitic. There are innumerable passages which speak of the reality as qualified monistic Vishishta Advaita. There are some who are clearly cosmic, that is universal. 
So these three levels, the universal or the cosmic reality is spoken of as also that which is Vishishta Advaita, the qualified monism and Advaita. Commentators have been singling out or teasing out from the Upanishads only those verses which speak, which they feel is the only words and the only doctrines. An Advaitic philosopher will look at everything through the lens of Advaita. But since they have been spoken of by various sages down thousands of years, and every possible angle of vision has been taken into account. So what we have is a comprehensive view of the reality. You know, Sri Ramakrishna, he practiced all the spiritual disciplines of his day. Why? Well, he had a time, and he had inclination, and he had to demonstrate to the world at large, the future humanity, that Jotomot Totopant, as so, as so many faiths, so many paths. We find the same thing has been taking place in the Upanishads. Every possible path has been explored. And then it has been presented to us through these Upanishads. The topic was secret knowledge, rahasya. Why rahasya? What's so secret about them? Well, they are published, actually. The secret comes because they are so profound. They have to be learned under authentic gurus first. They also need a degree of mental purification and meditation. And that's the reason why in the Upanishads literature, we find that the rishis are not out to form secret societies. Oh, secret knowledge, in? we have all the secrets. There are some secret societies even today that we know the secrets of the universe. So we won't tell you, you become a member. It wasn't like that. The knowledge was profound. All through the Upanishads, as they are speaking about that reality that is transcendent and imminent, they are speaking about it amazingly through the language of meditation. Both the doctrines and the meditations are joined together. You will never, never, never know the Upanishads through philology or through literary criticism. You will know it only through meditation. And that's why all the teachings of the Upanishads are meditations. They are upasanas. As, as you've described, upasad, you come nearby and listen and learn. That is upasata. It's a mental attitude. You, you approach that reality. So these were the meditations and they are called vidyas. Shandilya vidya, dhara vidya, all these vidyas are there. Every teaching of the Upanishad is a meditation. And that is the reason why they are called secret knowledge. You've got to meditate first, secretly, quietly, after being instructed by an authentic guru. We have so many people teaching the Upanishads, but nobody actually meditating according to the Upanishadic, you can say, teachings. And that's why they, they, are, they appear kind of one-dimensional. The Upanishad are uh, multi-dimensional. As I mentioned before, these were not the, Swami says, Swamiji, they are not the exclusive, you can say, products of 
इंटेंस मेडिटेशन श्री राम कृष्ण से इज हाउ हार्ड द ऋषि इज वर्क दे लेफ्ट द हर्मिटेज इन द मॉर्निंग दे वेंट आउट दे मेडिटेटेड द होल डे एंड लिव्ड ऑन फ्रूट्स एंड रूट्स एक्सेट्रा एंड दे रिटर्न बैक ओनली इन द इवनिंग वी ऑल्सो फाइंड अमेजिंगली इन द उपनिषद द क्षत्रियज द किंगली क्लास किंग्स एंड एम्प्रोअर्स discussing these upanishads so certain parts of the upanishads are given actually by kings and there are there are passages which say oh this wasn't with you all it was only with the kings and that's why we rule the world we also find great debaters of the knowledge of brahman in gargi and maitri and apala are all these great f- women sages what they thought was the principles swami vivekananda says there are the first in the upanishad you find the dethroning of all the god all the gods in the vedic literature you have innumerable deities gods of fire and the wind and the smoke and the light and the clouds and the gods here there there everywhere and over that there's god of gods the pantheon was staggering we find they are all dethroned thrown out why god as the principle is built up the personalities of god the personality of god as a creator ruling destinies of human beings was intolerable in the old days you know we had the monarchies and we had kings so people conceptualized a god also as a great big monarch sitting somewhere in a nice place so we have the dethroning of the gods of that god and the building up of god as a principle the god as a person is broken down god impersonal is being built up and it would be ridiculous to have a human being as a person while this is going on so the human also is been broken down the person is broken down and the human being as a principle is built up and then comes the succeeding stages so the god as a person and man mankind as persons are broken down the principle is built up and then swami vivekananda says then comes the succeeding stages of their gradual convergence and this is what dwaita and vishishta dwaita and advaita means and finally when they converge the upanishads end with thou art that that principle which is there immanent and transcendental is everywhere within you also these are the you can say stages of upanishadic thought and evolution we also find swami vivekananda says that certain principles regarding matter also like space and all these things were spoken of but never in details nobody worked them out in details that's the reason why some of these upanishadic sayings are so akin to some modern scientific especially physics these some of these theories and there is hence a gradual you can say affinity growing between this upanishadic literature and this which has been spoken of by today's scientific in the thought this is the 
ancient literature yet modern. We have also the idea that how did it spread? Some of you can say, was it confined only to India or something like that? So no. This thought flowed out westward and eastward many times so. Because we find, as is mentioned, there's a book called Journey of the Upanishads to the West by Swami Tathagatananda, where he traces this thought percolating down and meeting ancient Greek thought in Alexandria or in Antioch. So there were two major waves of Upanishadic thought which spread out, out of India. We also find that during the medieval ages, there was a great king who was called Dara Shuko. He was heir apparent to the throne of India. His father was Shah Jahan, the great emperor of India. He was mystic, mystical by nature. And he was the eldest of the many children. And he was supposed to take over the throne. But of course, he was dethroned by Aurangzeb. He translated first 50 Upanishads into Persian. And this Persian manuscript, copies of that manuscript, were finally, you can say, translated by a Frenchman into Latin. And that slowly percolated down to this old German school, Schopenhauer and all these philosophers. And also, the study of Sanskrit was taken up by the French. So this has been slowly percolating down. We also have the whole of the Buddhistic philosophy. Buddha was a monk, and he was speaking at times in the words of the Upanishads. These monks went out because and spread the practical aspects of the philosophy and changed the culture of Asia. We also find at times that this rahasya, this secret knowledge, initially was meant only for the monks and not all monks, kind of the elite monks. So Swami Vivekananda says they are the rahasya. They meant only for the sannyasins, the ascetics. They used to take this and go to the forest and cultivate this knowledge. It was for the first time the Lord in his incarnation of Sri Krishna who brought this secret knowledge of the Upanishads and made it practical to each and every one through his teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Buddha, of course, he, he made it practical. And in this age, we also find now, Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda speaking about this practical aspect of religion. Swami Vivekananda says, if you see, I have spoken nothing but the Upanishads. And he is very clear. He's telling India, go back to your Upanishads, those shining, brilliant teachings. Don't waste your time with all these other esoteric doctrines. There is strength enough to invigorate you. So he wanted a revival in India 
base a spiritual revival based on the Upanishads. And he also wanted a universal revival. He's saying, it is this which is not based on any class or creed, it is universal. So people of all races and all climes and all countries can take up this. It is strengthening. So he, he had this plan of rejuvenating the national life of India through the Upanishads and also the philosophical and metaphysical foundations in the West, saying it calls on each and every one, man, woman, child, everyone, that you are that principle which is being embodied, that principle of existence, consciousness, bliss. And this will be the melding point of all other spiritual thoughts, religious thoughts, every other doctrine. They will find their correlates here. Swamiji has also has said, well, Sri Ramakrishna had come to revive this old Rishi ideal, these Rishis of old. <clears throat> they were householders, and some of them were monks, and let's say some of them were of the royal class, the kings and the emperors. Each and every one embodies that reality, and each and every one has to manifest that reality through his life and through his work and through his thoughts. And Swami Vivekananda is very clear, we have to become rishis. And so there is and there will be a revival of this rishi ideal. What is the meaning of the word rishi? Rishi is one who knows truth in its super sensuous levels. It's called the seer of mantras, mantra drashta. The rishi is also called one who knows the past, present and future, krant darshi. So this is the rishi ideal which will be revived and along with that, the Upanishads also are being revived. Imagine there was a time when it was so difficult to get even a copy of the Upanishads. I remember when, one first time when I was trying to buy a copy of the Upanishads, the bookseller lo looking curiously at me, saying, are you, are you sure you want to buy this? <laughs> yeah, I want to buy it. I want to read this. <laughs> Do you have any kind of background? I don't need any background. I have read Vivekananda and I've read Ramakrishna. Huh? <laughs> okay. Anyway, he wanted to sell his books. So. Yeah, the first was, I was delighted when I began reading just the translations. And slowly as I began reading in the original with the commentaries, it was, it changed my life. And this is what Swami Vivekananda says, go back to your Upanishads, he's telling in there, go back to your Upanishads. And not only that, he is telling humanity, <laughs> go back to your Upanishads. You will understand it because that truth is there within you. And these Upanishads are speaking that truth. Every heart holds that truth, and that truth will become manifest through this. Yes, but then, okay, well, what about meditation? Yeah. As you keep on meditating, where will you get such sub sublime? When I was reading, I said, one after another, I was kind of, my heart used to palpitate, not out of sickness or illness or kind of exhaustion. <sighs> 
How could these things happen here? Savaesha Mahanaja Atma Yoyam Vignanamaya Praneshu Anta Rudaya Akasha Tasmin Sete Sarvasya Vashi Sarvasya Ishana Sarvasya Adipati etc. Long passages, sublime passages. That great birthless self identified with your intellect, seated in the midst of your pranas, the sense organs, and saying, he, that is the control of all, which is residing in the space of the heart. That is the ruler of all. That is the lord of all. There. So that transcendental reality has been made imminent. The principle is here. And nowhere will you find such sublime passages that makes you feel, yes, finally, I am not just a mere human being. This is the gift of what is called Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of Brahman. And we have seen Satya Kama, Aruni, Sveta Ketu, Yagne Valka, Kargi, Maitri, such noble characters, what made them so great? Just the knowledge of Brahman. And if that knowledge can transform these people, it's going to transform you all. Go to your Upanishads. Go back to your Upanishads. There is a long discussion in one of the Upanishads called the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. And Yagnya Valka at the end tells one of his challengers, Shakalya, saying, Tvam Tva Upanishadam Purusham Prichami. I ask you, tell me of that reality called the Purusha which is definitely spoken of only in the Upanishads. Upanishadam Purusham. That's a, that beautiful phrase. Phrase, Upanishadam Purusham Prachami. I speak. Shakalya could not answer and Yagne could beat every, all the great knows of Brahman in that assembly. It tells us of that reality spoken of in the Upanishads as spoken of as Purusha, the cosmic person with his hands and feet and mouths and legs everywhere, Sahasra, Shir, Shah, Purusha, with a thousand heads, thousand heights, every head, every hand, every limb, every one of us are parts of that great cosmic person. This can be known only to the Upanishads. So how do we know it? This is where Sri Ramakrishna comes in. Swami Vivekananda says, you can understand the Vedas more clearly through the life of Sri Ramakrishna. He is the new lens through which you can study this literature. And all interpretations of the Upanishads, if seen through the life of Sri Ramakrishna, they become more clear. As I've said before, the old traditions were all, were, are lost. So they had to now become, you can say, into a new tradition. So th these truths have to be cushioned by some of the old traditions. Since the old traditions are all gone away, the commentator revives a little, but these new traditions have to now enfold those truths. You cannot say, I am Brahman, I am Brahman. You know, people say, I am Brahman. What Brahman? They don't know anything about the Brahman. Because that cushioning isn't there. The cushioning of that spiritual culture isn't there. And that spiritual culture in this age has been brought by Sri Ramakrishna. He is now, for this age, the Purusha spoken of 
in the Upanishad. Tvam Upanishadam Purusham Prichami. If you want to know the truths of this Upanishad, those, these grand principles of existence and consciousness and bliss, we'll have to see it through the lens of Sri Ramakrishna. Swami Vivekananda says, his light throws a bright searchlight on these old scriptures. In fact, his whole life was nothing but to bring back to the old Vedic fold all those doctrines and sects which had emerged from it and which had strayed so far away, they appeared disparate, separate, and isolated. He brought them all together. He is that Upanishadic Purusha. And if we meditate on him, like we used to meditate on the old philosophical, you can see, doctrines of the Upanishads, which are extremely difficult. If you meditate on Sri Krishna, you will get the fruits of this teachings of the Upanishads. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Sri Ram Krishna Rapanamastu Announcements. Next Sunday, April 4, at Hollywood Temple, Resurrection in Our Hearts. Swami Sarvadevananda will speak on this resurrection. April 3rd is also Ram Nam. So Tuesdays we have at 4.30 Narada's Way of Divine Love by Swami Sarvadevananda. And we also have at 7.30 on Tuesdays Shanti Gita, the Song of Peace. Wednesdays at 7.30 we have the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Thursdays 7.30 p.m. we have the Bhagavad Gita Fridays, again 7.30 p.m., Living Wisdom of Swami Abhedananda. Saturdays, morning, 10 o'clock, Pacific time here, local time. It's a guided meditation called Meditation Skills for Meditators. Sundays, we have Sanskrit classes given by Sukirta. Uh, we also need to uh, mention that 
Saturday, 24th April, we have the annual members meeting. So members for members only. And I would like all the members to be, be able to participate in that Zoom, you can say, meeting like we had last year. 24th April also, we have in the evening Hanuman Jayanti from 4 p.m. So we'll chant the Hanuman Chalisa for 11 times and followed by talks by Swami Sarvadevananda and Satyamayananda. Okay. There's a question and there's also a comment I thought I'd read out. Uh, the comment is Swami Nikhilananda's translations of the Upanishads in four volumes are the best investment I have ever made. An hour a day with these books, at least five days a week, constantly renews my life. Very beautiful, good. Beautiful comment. Yeah. Then the question, the Kata Upanishad says, on his command, the winds blow and clouds rain. But Advaitic commentators say he is a mere witness. So is God a witness or a commander? Hmm. You see, what happens is witness. What does he witness? The problem is, you, why don't you look at other aspects of the reality? The reality is dynamic. The witness, as we say, the background. And that background is consciousness. It's not that somebody is sitting there with an one eye open looking at you, everything. The background of the reality is consciousness. It is beyond gross, subtle, and causal dimensions of the universe. That's why it's called as a witness. In order for that met metaphysical consciousness to be explained in terms of the human body, the individual, we call it as a witness. We also, in Advaita Vedanta, if you do not know, it's also called Antaryami, the inner controller. So, out of Bhayad Yasya Tapati, Bhayad Tapati Surya, Bhayad Indrasya Agnishya, Vayur Dhavati Panchama, it's also found in the other Upanishads also fear of him, that is, apart from God, there is nothing else. And we need to give up all our pretensions of separateness, of separate powers, of our own ego, manufacturing this idea of, you can say, the doer. Everything is over, and now we just come down to there is just one. So this reality is static, dynamic, and all these clouds and sun and wind and moons are ultimately found to be nothing but the body of God in its lower Advaitic, you can say, Vishishta Advaitic. And in the highest Advaitic experience, there is no clouds, no rain, no controller, no impeller, and there's nothing. There's only one reality called Brahman. So when you speak about witness, like I said, there are many, many stages where the personal God is made impersonal, the personal man is made impersonal, and then they're slowly converging towards one. The climax comes, thou art that. So there is no separate God outside in that stage. Please get this in your head. Advaita means I'm here and that also, that controller is there. It's not like that. That same controller is also there within you. There is only one principle. There is only one reality. There is no God, no personal God. There is no nature. There is no individual soul. Okay. Two questions. One, what is the connection between knowledge and ego? And the second, how to study the Upanishad? 
Ah, knowledge and ego. Well, you know, Sri Ramakrishna says, whenever you have ego, it means non-knowledge, ignorance. Because it's ignorance that creates the sense of ego, individual, you can say the individuality. Real knowledge comes naham, naham, not I, not I. So this ego, as we say, this individuality, when it is in the body, when it is absorbed or you can say enmeshed with the body and along with the perceptions, it creates for itself an identity. In the pure, uh, you can say, asmita, that is, when that I is not identified with the body, with the senses, with the objects, in its pure sense, there is called asmita. So, to remove off this I, which is like a small cloud that covers a huge sun, you know clouds cannot cover the huge sun, but it appears to. So, first transform that ego from the tamas, to rajas, from rajas to sattva, and then from sattva, even give that up, you come to something called the pure I. That I is spread out all over the world, in everything, in every cell. And after that, you even transcend that, and then you get what is called knowledge. And uh, the second question was, how do we study the Upanishads? Well, read a passage and think deeply on it, meditate on it. You no, know, the uh, Shanti Mantra, the peace chant that I'd given, speaks about that. May all the virtues that are taught in the Upanishad, may they manifest themselves in me. May I not deny Brahman, the reality. May not Brahman deny me. May not that reality divorce me from itself. So this is what, so, and wh how, what do you need to study? Well, Swami Vivekananda is very clear. The earth's freshest, the best flowers, those who are strong, the heroic, Ashishto, Dhradishto, Balishto, Medhavi, the intelligent, they will take up the Upanishads. Yes, it's, it, the, these, these Upanishads are a mine of great strength. So start slowly and read and meditate, read and meditate. Question, the Upanishadic ideal of oneness is it a mere poetic expression, or is this an actual physical reality? If it's a physical reality, why did Buddha, another deep meditator, not acknowledge the same? Well, Buddha, did Buddha speak of a nirvana? He did, of course. In the Upanishads and the Vedic literature, it's called Brahma nirvana getting extinguished nirvana. And we say getting extinguished in Brahma nirvana. It's Brahma nirvana. So where the words along with thought recoil, you cannot speak about it. So did he not speak about it? How do you know he never spoke about it? It cannot be articulated properly. And when you talk about oneness, what do you mean physical oneness? This physical oneness has been spoken of by science. Can you today disprove that there is no oneness? We are one physically. The whole tree of life has come out from one small cell. That atom and molecule which is there in your body is found everywhere. It's everything is built on the same plan. So physically, the universe is one. Mentally, it is one because we can communicate. We are all parts of that cosmic mind. And about 
is it realizable all these rishis they spoke about truths which they realized it these are experiences of the sages these are not simply you can say philosophic musings these are realizations so yes they can be realized they are realized and there will always be people who will realize the oneness the spiritual you can say oneness of the universe the questioner objects in humility i submit buddha never speaks of oneness no he never speaks of oneness he spoke about nirvana that's what i said he never spoke of he spoke about oneness and you see what happens is he was the first one who as i say the breaker down of the caste his heart went down to each and every one even to animals what does it speak about division no it speaks of oneness he may not have spoken about it, but he acted out that large great heart which loved each and everything and everybody he was the first one to come and bridge the gap between the high and the low the rich and the poor so this is preaching of oneness in its practical aspects another question whether god is beyond logic and common sense how can we try to realize him without applying logic well you can apply logic because the brahma sutras the upanishads are the shruti pramana the the brahma sutra tad yukti so you use reasoning as far as it takes you there is something called thought belief awareness simply mouthing certain things that we have learned from our culture from our religion from our teachers from everything no become aware of the thought processes so we use these thought processes nobody says go and swallow up all those things without questioning them no you have to question you have to dissect them you have to bring it under the scrutiny of your will of your logic of your reason and when you've discarded all the false things then you will come to know what is because the upanishads also say manasai vedam aptavyam you have to realize it through the mind alone but the pure mind that processes of reasoning and logic itself will be a form of purification of the mind you will see how much of garbage that has been collected over the years in our mind and you start cleaning it and the conception of god you see we we say is a yeah god god in his absolute aspect in its relative aspect god is spoken as the reality which is manifested in the world every aspect of this universe this universe is the body of god let's put it like that it's not something with the hands and feet and head and legs those those are deities which as i said in the upanishads the long they kind of dethroned all those gods the god as a principle and human beings today are understanding science is the same in korea in india in the us in europe anywhere why because it speaks of principles those principles are universal and th- the they can be scientists in all countries doing the same methods they can practicalize it so the principles have given of the reality of brahman now you can apply it through your own scientific method to logic to reason become aware of the thought belief whatever bring and see what is not right discard you must have the power to pull 
away from what is unreal, false memories, false logic, and you will attain that which is beyond the mind. Question. Swamiji, how can we move more and more towards the strength and purity needed to actually practice the Upanishads? What practical suggestions for gaining this strength and purity can you give us? First thing is, we appear so insignificant, tiny, weak. Swami Vivekananda says, strength, strength, strength is what the open shut speak to me. He also speaks of saying the idea of fearlessness comes, abhi, abhi. There is another dimension which is directly opposite to what you feel, low, weak, insignificant, lost in this crowd. Imagine. But no, the, that same Upanishad is saying, that same sun which is reflected in millions and millions and millions of globules of water is shining brilliantly in you also. So when you find that there's another dimension, a vaster, greater dimension, there will come energy in work, there will come clarity in thought, your relationships will be based on love. You will be more compassionate. You will be more understanding. You will be a new person. When you know there is no birth, no death for you, nothing can ever touch you. So how do you practice it? Well, it starts with a little, slowly and slowly. Suppose I ask you, can you run uh, the one mile in uh, three, three, and, um, three minutes or something like that? No, but you can if you practice hard enough. Keep on, keep on, and on, and on, and on, and on. This is what religion is, practice. I remember uh, a monk was telling us, you know, th some devotees had asked him in Mayavati, tell us in one word, what is religion? He said, practice. Just practice. So if you can do that, there it is. Question, why in the Vedas is Brahman indicated by many names, such as Narayana, Shiva? Does it not confuse us? No, it doesn't. <laughs> How many names have you got? Is, 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 a person is there. Now she is a mother, she is a sister, she is a daughter, she is a wife. She has, she has got so many identities. But it's the same person. And once you understand the characteristics of this Vedanta, you would not say, why is, why is it called Narayana? Why is it called Shiva? <laughs> no, no. It's that same that same reality has been called by different names. One God with a thousand names. Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Tat Sat Sri Ramakrishna Rapanamastu